Good morning, boys and New Hope family. I hope this message finds you all well. Hope you're having a great day. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, we want to continue our conversation here with John chapter 6. Uh, last week we left off with the crowd catching up to Jesus, and Jesus challenged the crowd on why they were following him. Uh, most of them are following Jesus because of the signs and wonders and miracles he performed, uh, specifically his healings that he did. He just fed them all yesterday in this timeline. He fed them all yesterday. And now the crowd is asking again for a sign that Jesus was sent by God. And Jesus goes on to describe that why he was sent by the Father, that he was sent to gather all who believe in him and not lose any of those that will believe in his name. And so now we see in the rest of this chapter, starting in verse 41 in chapter 6, we see the rest of this chapter, Jesus further clarify uh, to the crowd, to his disciples, to us, who he is. So let's go ahead and begin with verses 41 to 51 in chapter 6. It says that this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is, not, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will be, uh, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to Me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. I tell you the truth: He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So initially the crowd sees Jesus only as the son of Mary and Joseph. And remember, they asked him for another sign to say who he was, as proof of his of who he that he had come down from heaven. They're having a really hard time accepting that Jesus was sent from heaven. After all, they know his siblings, they know his parents, um, they know who he is, and I think that's a significant point. We see Jesus as we want to see Jesus. I mean, if we're seeking his grace, we'll see that, but we may not notice his justice. And if we see Jesus as a judge against our sins, we miss, uh, miss him being the ransom given for those sins. And so I, the older I get, the more I believe that we just see what we want to see. And I think our faith is the same way. We see what we want to see. And in this case, the crowd saw Jesus only as a son of Mary and Joseph. Yet Jesus is so much bigger than our preconceptions. Um, Jesus rebuked the crowd, saying, Stop grumbling. He tells them that God has sent him to draw people to himself, and that Jesus will raise his people up in the last day. Jesus reminds them that God is bigger than their idea of who he should be. And so I think that's significant, that Jesus really understands the crowd and their motivation, saying, Look, you think I'm this, but I am so much greater than what you think I am. I think we can often put Jesus in that same box, um, and we'll talk about more here in a minute. But we want to see, at the end of this passage, Jesus makes a very difficult statement. He says, For any to believe in him, that he is the bread of life, and if man eats of this bread, he will live forever, and this bread is my flesh. Now, why is that a difficult statement for the crowd to understand? Um, how can Jesus give his body for them to eat? Um, I think about Jesus' words in the Last Supper, some months in the future from this event. Uh, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat of this and be thankful. And Jesus is always consistent about his statement, who he is, why he came, and what our response should be. And so the idea of, this is my flesh, I am the bread of life, he who eats of my flesh will live forever, is just a very hard statement for the Jews to understand. And so we'll see that here as we carry on in the chapter. Uh, let's read verses 52 to 59 next. It says, Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you, will, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, 
so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Our forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So here we see the crowd's response to Jesus' statement about being the flesh and eating his flesh. They're just having a really hard time accepting that. In fact, it, it creates kind of an uproar among the crowd. Um, these people were aghast that Jesus would want them to eat of his body, eat of his physical body. But again, it's into this tumult that Jesus speaks, into this ruckus and roar of the crowd basically being upset at the statement that Jesus speaks into that. Um, and what does he say? Not only that he, he says that, excuse me, not only he's saying that they must eat his flesh, but now they must drink his blood too. Well, what does that mean? Jesus is nur just, Jesus nourished the crowd the day before this with bread and fish. Today he's trying to understand that what he offers is more significant than just a physical meal. While bread and fish give life to the body, Jesus is offering life to the soul. And to eat and drink of Jesus is to abide in Jesus. So the verse sounds like that if we want to have the life that God calls us to live, we have to trust and believe in Jesus. And at least uh, that's the theme I see repeated throughout these past few chapters. We have to trust and believe in Jesus. We have to accept him fully and truly understand and accept what he offers us. Accept this life-giving bread, this life-giving drink that he is giving us, this living water that he promised the Samaritan woman. Folks, it's that faith in Jesus that sustains us more so than any meal we might have. It's that faith in Jesus that will sustain us far beyond the bread and fish the crowd received. And so I think that's what Jesus is trying to get across to them. They need to understand and accept that. But let's continue on in verses 60 to 71. It says this, On hearing it, on hearing it, meaning that teaching about Jesus' flesh and his blood, upon hearing this teaching, um, many disciples, this is hard to accept. I'm sorry, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which them do not believe, and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, I have not chosen you the twelve. And for have I not chosen you the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. So the first thing that strikes me about that passage is Jesus had other disciples apart from the twelve. Um, yet upon hearing the words, this challenge from Jesus, they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, these other disciples left. They stopped following him because of that. But Jesus just finished verses 62 to 64, telling them that his words are life-giving. They provide a way to eternal life. What was it about this teaching that made these men stop following Jesus? You know, and more to the point today, why do people stop following Jesus? You know, Jesus made this statement, and the disciples, the other disciples, not the twelve, that were following him stopped because of this teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But Jesus says that his flesh and his blood was the Holy Spirit filling up and giving life to the believer. So why do these men stop following Jesus? I think it can be summed up in one word. The expectations they had for Jesus were not being met. Their expectations for who Jesus was and what he would do and how he would do it weren't being met. Maybe they're following Jesus to see Rome overthrown. Maybe they're following him because they thought he was, a cool, he was the cool kid. Or maybe because he'd healed them and they felt obligated to do so. We don't know the background on these other disciples. Uh, we just know that they stopped following him early on in his ministry. Uh, my guess is they stopped following Jesus because he wasn't living up to their expectations of who they wanted him to be. But I think we all know someone who's done the same thing. We like to put God in a box that we can understand and sometimes even control that box. We want our Savior to be neat and tidy and not meddle in our affairs. But let us live our lives as we want to. You know, I think that's what these, these other disciples were looking for. They were looking for a God that 
fit into their preconceived notion of how that should operate. But can I make this statement real quick? God is so much bigger than our expectations. He wants to do so much more in our lives and provides than just simply provide assurance to heaven. Um, but and how do I know that? Again, at verse 67 and 69, Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. What a statement. What a well, I want to just paint this picture. I can see Jesus and Peter standing side by side, um, watching as a multitude of people disperse, this crowd that followed Jesus the last few days, and they start to disperse, and along with them go some of the other disciples who have been following Jesus. I picture them standing side by side, staring at the backs of these men as they walk away, and Jesus asked the twelve, do you also want to leave? And Peter, the impulsive Peter, responds, Lord, we have nowhere else to go. Because you give eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. We want to stay with you because you are the Holy One of God. You're the Messiah who has come to save the world. What a statement. What a statement by Peter that Jesus came to be that person. Jesus replies that he'd chosen the twelve and even the one who betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. And what does that mean? That all who God has chosen, the sum will not lose. These twelve were chosen by God. He wasn't going to lose them unless they chose a different path. And we just started done studying those results of those 12 men a couple of months ago so we can see the results of God choosing these 12 disciples. We saw the results of what they did in the future. So what do we take away from this chapter? A few things, I think. I think first, Jesus is the bread of life and offers this to all people. He could have been selective with the crowd. Um, on who he fed, and, but he didn't. He didn't feed them based upon their future ability to follow him, but on their current need. Jesus didn't choose to feed people based upon what they might do, but on what their actual need was at that time. And so Jesus is always near to us. He's always right there with us to meet us in our time of need, whatever that might look like. I think that's the first thing we can learn. That he is that bread of life for all people. And second, Jesus is so much bigger than our expectations. He wants to do more for us, more in us, more through us than we can possibly imagine. But yet, I think we let those disciples try to put Jesus in a box to, to behave and act and do certain things in a certain way to make us happy. But Jesus is so much bigger than those expectations. And finally, nowhere else can we find this eternal life. As Peter said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where else shall we go? You know, Jesus is right there as in Revelation, knocking at the door of our hearts and we have to let him in. But as Pastor Matthew said last week, Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He doesn't go where he's not invited. He doesn't stay where he's not wanted. And folks, I can't promise you an easy life if you follow Jesus. But Jesus can promise you that if you follow him, it'll be worth it. Lord, we thank you for this morning and this time together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, for your example and your conviction to us to keep soaking up that bread of life, to keep drinking in your Holy Spirit, to give us life and abundance, Lord. Father, help us this week to not be disappointed when you don't meet our expectations, Lord. But God, let us be thankful and faithful to all you've called us to do. Lord, we love you. And that's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thanks so much for joining me, folks. So glad you're here. Remember that we'll see you next week in the chapter 7 of John. But remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.